In this episode of EcoSense for Living, we explore the hidden cost of the fashion industry, as well as some creative solutions. Clothing is actually 6% of landfill waste in the United States. A lot of people come to me and say, well, I'm not really interested in fashion. But my question for them is always, well, are you wearing clothes? If everyone in the United States bought one item used this year instead of new, that's the equivalent of taking half a million cars off the road for an entire year. Before you buy your next piece of clothing, think about where it came from and the story behind it. I once rather infamously walked into a Kmart and bought seven pairs of $7 shoes. I bought the store out of my size and I just did it because I was like, what? They're gonna, they're gonna fall apart. Like, why not? I might as well just buy a bunch of them. And that's what I did. I just would wear them for about three weeks. They would get a hole in them and then I would throw them away. And then I put on another pair and it just, the cycle would repeat itself. I just had this total aha moment where I was like, this is ridiculous. I am paying so much money for clothes that don't last. And I just decided that I wanted to own something that was slightly better made that would last longer. My name is Elizabeth Klein. I am a journalist and the author of Overdressed, The Shockingly High Cost of Cheap Fashion and The Conscious Closet, The Revolutionary Guide to Looking Good While Doing Good. I was a huge bargain shopper and I realized at some point I had no idea where the stuff was made, what kind of impact it was having on the environment. And just out of my own personal consumption habits, I went on this journey to discover that hidden story of the environmental impact of what we wear. There's a growing awareness about reducing waste in the US, which is great, but a lot of people aren't making that connection yet about clothing. And clothing is actually 6% of landfill waste in the United States. So while we're really doing, I think, a lot of good work to reduce our waste to landfills and other areas, plastic bottles, cardboard, we know to recycle those things, but we don't often make that connection when it comes to clothes. Most Americans, especially most American women, own a lot of clothes, and I think because they're hidden away in our closet, sometimes we don't even register it. I know that was my experience. I just opened my closet one day and I was like, oh my gosh, I own more clothing than anything else in my life. I owned 350 items of clothing and I wore maybe 10% of it. And one of the first things that I discovered in my research is that I was a typical American consumer. Americans are the biggest consumers of clothing in the world. Americans only wear about 14% of what's in their closet. And I think it's really interesting how extreme this is compared to other places in the world. We buy 21 billion garments per year as a country, and it's estimated that 100 billion garments get made around the world every year. That means we're buying one in five garments manufactured in the world. So really like the heart of what makes clothing disposable is the quantities that it's produced in. So, you know, it used to be that chains would make 2000 pieces of something. Now they make 2 million pieces of something. I think most people now see clothing as something that's almost disposable. Uh, it's something you can consume almost mindlessly. Uh, you can go into a store and you're shopping for something else and you're like, oh, it's whatever, three for one t-shirts. So clothing has just become something that we don't have to put a lot of thought into. But I always try to get people to understand that those choices have impacts. So it is something that we do need to be mindful about consuming. Americans are throwing away into the trash 25 billion garments every year. It's either inconvenient to donate um, or people spend so little on their clothes that they are just thinking, why, why not? I paid five, $5 for it, so I'm just gonna put it in the trash. But what most people don't realize is that one, most clothing is either reusable or recyclable. And then the other point is that landfills are a really terrible place to put clothes because if it's a natural fiber, 
it's gonna release methane when it's breaking down, which is a greenhouse gas that is 24 times more potent than CO2. So it is even worse for the environment than uh, carbon dioxide, which most of us know to be concerned about. And if it's a synthetic material, like your polyesters, your nylon, your acrylic, it is made out of plastic. And if you only wear that garment once, that is another type of single use plastic. You know, we're so mindful about our water bottles, recycling, trying to avoid plastics, but we need to have that same reflection when it comes to what we wear. The environmental cost of the fashion industry is huge. Pretty much the whole clothing industry is dependent on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are used to make synthetic materials to create pesticides to power factories and in the chemicals and dyes and finishes that make our clothing look the way we expect them to. The fashion industry uses 19 million tons of chemicals every year and 342 million barrels of oil. It is responsible for 8% of carbon emissions. So while we're talking about reducing the emissions of driving, for example, or cutting out our single-use plastic consumption, why aren't we talking about this 8% of emissions that are associated just with what we're wearing? So there isn't a perfectly green fiber. Every single material we wear has its own unique environmental problems. Polyester is made out of a fossil fuel, so it's non-renewable resource, but it also sheds microplastics into our oceans. Cotton is one of the biggest users of pesticides in the world, and those pesticides can pollute the ground and water around cotton fields, but they can also impact the health of cotton farmers. And cotton also uses a lot of water. The clothing industry uses 24 trillion gallons of water every year. That's enough to fill 37 million Olympic-sized pools. In 1990, as much as 50% of all the clothing sold in the United States was also made in the United States. And today, it's less than 3%. About a third of the clothes that are purchased in the United States are manufactured in China, and almost all of the rest of them are also made in other Southeast Asian countries. Around the world, uh, it's almost a universal fact that garment workers are making sub-poverty wages, which means they don't make enough money to get by, to make ends meet. I'm a journalist, so for me, I, I look at the impact of the clothing industry as a researcher and someone who's just interested in the details, but I'm also a consumer. You know, I also have to get dressed every morning. And I think the most profound shift in my life is just deciding to be aware, aware of that environmental impact, aware of that social impact of what I'm buying and what I'm putting on my body every day. How can we be fashionable and have less impact on the planet? I grew up obsessed with recycling because of my parents. When I was a kid, I really wanted to be a designer and I expressed that in so many different ways. It just sort of came out of my fingertips and I couldn't really help it. But I would make anything I could out of whatever I could get my hands on. And I have an older sister who always had Barbies and dolls and dress up things in the house. And there's sort of a story in my family that one day my parents came home and I had used all of the tissues and all of the tape in their office to make an entire collection of wedding gowns for all of the Barbies. And she told me, you know, you can't do that. You can't use all my stuff. And she said, I will take you to a fabric store so you have your own things to play with. It was a little Mennonite fabric store in central Pennsylvania where I grew up and the local community made their own clothes and they saw the value of the scrap material and they had a big steel barrel that they would fill with all their scraps and that was like my trip to the toy store. The origin of Zero Waste Daniel is almost by accident. I knew I wanted to be a designer and I studied design and I came to New York to sort of make my fortune as a New York designer. 
I was making these pieces and having some critical success with them, I wasn't really able to make money doing it. So I made the tough decision to close my design business down and reevaluate my life. This one day where I had nothing going on and had sort of given up on my whole business, made myself a shirt out of my leftovers and posted it on my Instagram, it changed my life. I posted this one post basically saying I wanted a shirt, so I made one. And it got more engagement than anything I had ever posted. And I realized that by making work that wasn't for supermodels or the runway, I started to engage people who were like me. Zero waste is super important in my life for so many reasons. I think living a life of low and responsible consumption just helps me feel like I'm doing the right thing. And once I started living that way fully and slowing down and considering my different purchases, where I'm getting things, how I get from place to place, all of those little decisions in my life and trying to eliminate waste in them, I started feeling so much better. It's not like a mandate or a religion or a belief system that you have to adhere to. It's more like a yoga practice where you try your best every day and some days are really good and some days are harder than others. Every single piece that gets cut off that would initially be determined as waste in the production process is saved for reuse and leaves the store as a finished product. Fab Scrap is an amazing nonprofit that is kind of changing my life. <laughs> when they started, their mission was to start quantifying and closing the loop on the fashion industry's textile waste. I had just sort of been going into factories, going to my neighbors, asking people for donations. Can I take your scraps? Can I take your trash? And Fab Scrap has grown in the last three years to be collecting from over 400 designers around New York City. And all of the fabric that's going into my production is upcycled material that was intended for landfill. At any given time, they're holding onto tens of thousands of pounds of textiles in their Brooklyn warehouse. For some people, a scrap is a small piece that you can't reuse. But for a major brand, one or two yards is a scrap because it's not something that they can put into production. The end of a roll, a fabric that didn't test well, something that was from last season, it's scrap. So you have to think on an industrial scale, almost like the scrap metal business, the scrap iron business, the scrap fabric business can be giant bolts of material that are going to landfill. A lot of people come to me and say, well, I'm not really interested in fashion. But my question for them is always, well, are you wearing clothes? Because everyone wears clothes, usually every day. <laughs> so we use clothing for so many different reasons other than fashion. We use it to protect ourselves from the elements. We use it as a social signifier of what our job or our economic status or our position in society is. It's one of the most powerful forms of nonverbal communication that we have as a global society. And still, so many people think because they're not into fashion, it has nothing to do with them. We have three different types of customers predominantly. When I started this line, my target customer was me. And I'm different people. I, on one hand, am someone who cares about street style and I want to be cool and look fashionable. On the other hand, I'm someone who makes things at home, cares about how things are made, and I am really into the process. And the other part of me is an environmental activist. We might already have enough clothes in the world. There's so much research that says that every secondary market is flooded, every resource is tapped. So how are we going to use what we have and make new things? Everyone is sweeping out their closets. These consignment stores are filled with so much cool clothing, but we as individuals love to personalize our clothes. So I've expanded my line into a more modular system where we have our basic designs, but also iron on and so on patches that embellish and enhance them and DIY and customize your own at home. And this is a great way to customize thrift and update old pieces and make them new. 
one of my professors told me in college, you're not a fashion designer. You're a fine artist trapped in a fashion designer's body. And I like to prove that by adding time, value, and expertise to even the smallest, most insignificant pieces, we can make them the most beautiful and most valuable. So these one-of-a-kind mosaics and portraits that I make are made out of the smallest, hardest-to-use scraps. One thing that I love about our product is that it's such a conversation starter. And even for people who don't care about environmentalism, there's a story to how their clothes are made. So I find that even for people who don't care, they can't help but learn the story and share it with people when they're wearing these pieces. I have this belief that if everyone just does their best at home and does their best at work, we'd be living in a different world. Is it that you can help them start a recycling or a composting program in your office? Is it that you can call a vendor and say, hey, can you stop sending these to me in disposable plastic? Can you switch from disposable forks to reusable? And can you help make a product that solves a problem? And if we all just do our part every day, we'll change the world together. Consignment shopping is not a new concept, but it's beginning to be the wave of the future. We are the world's largest online thrift and consignment store. We list close to 3 million unique items for sale on ThreadUp.com and process upwards of about 100,000 items a day. You can hit refresh and a store's worth of items have just been newly listed. Our mission at ThreadUp is to teach a generation to think secondhand first. And we want to do that by making secondhand as accessible to everyone, which means offering price points that everyone can afford, selling the widest range of brands, accepting the widest range of brands for clean out so anyone can participate in the circular economy. As shoppers, we're buying twice as much as we did 20 years ago. We're keeping that those purchases half as long and that's creating a real negative impact on our planet. If everyone in the United States bought one item used this year instead of new, that's the equivalent of taking half a million cars off the road for an entire year. If you resell an item, it extends its life and reduces its carbon footprint by up to 84%. We already have enough awesome clothes in the world. We could just wear those. We take about 50% of what is sent into us. We are only able to take what we can resell, which means that it needs to be very high quality. It needs to be clean. It can't be damaged. For the 50% of items that come in that we aren't able to resell, we have a variety of programs designed to extend the life of those garments and recycle them in the most responsible way that we can. We also have an aftermarket code of conduct that we require all of our partners to sign and adhere to that covers items like res social responsibility, respect for emerging nations, environmental impact to make sure that the partners we're working with are on the same page and have the same values that we do. Because ultimately, even if we can't take it, our, our goal is to keep it out of landfill. The idea of single-use outfits, it's always been a part of our culture. It's always just been this accepted and celebrated thing to get your homecoming dress, to get your prom dress. We have seen at ThreadUp certainly a mind shift over the last years of people starting to think about the end of life of their garment at the point of purchase. And if it's an immediate end, whether that's okay and whether there's an alternative. Can they borrow a dress? Can they buy a secondhand dress and pay for alterations? Um, you know, those things um, that are a more responsible way to still celebrate like important moments in our culture. I do think we are creating, helping to create a new normal when we talk about teaching a generation to think secondhand first. And I think one of the things that is also special about ThreadUp is while we bring people in with just the sheer volume and excitement of the inventory offering. I think what we're also trying to do is bring them along and educate them about better shopping habits as well. So we talk about single use plastics. We talk about clothing care and how many times you're supposed to wash your clothes or not. That was a, a hot topic there for a while. And we're just trying to bring everyone into this larger awareness around the full life cycle of clothing. So ThreadUp, we don't just sell secondhand clothes. We also help people resell their clothing and join the circular economy via our cleanup kits. 
So super easy, you go online, you can print a label or you can order a clean out kit. We'll send you a bag that you can fill with items that you no longer want or need. And that is shipped for free to us. And we basically take it from there. Photograph, list it, price it, everything. And you kick back, earn a little shopping credit or cash, or you can also choose to donate it, in which case we'll give $5 for each bag to the charity of your choice. It's an exciting time for secondhand. Right now, the resale industry is growing 21 times faster, I think, than traditional retail. And a lot of that growth is being driven by millennials and Gen Z, who, Gen Z especially, two, one in three will buy a secondhand item this year. So they're just adopting secondhand at like two and a half times the rate of any other generation. I have two Gen Z kids who we're leaving this planet to. And I work really hard and it's important to me to feel connected and passionate to what I'm doing. I wanna be part of the solution. And I think that feeling is shared across our organization. I wear only secondhand. Yes, I've been in this business a very long time. I would say 95% of my considerable wardrobe is thrifted. I know I'm an extreme version. My children understand that new clothing is produced at a cost, not just monetarily, but for the planet, and to make those decisions wisely. When you do want to purchase something new, it's not a frivolous, light decision. Think about what you're doing with it, how long you're going to wear it, is it quality? and whenever possible, find a secondhand option first. The college town of Athens, Georgia is home to an eco-friendly boutique that's part of the community. I think that we're so disconnected from how our clothing is being made. You know, when you go into a store, you just see beautiful things and they're well designed, uh, but you don't see how they're being made and who makes them. And so it was very important to me when I opened Community that I wanted our sewing area to be part of our retail store because I wanted to uh, break down that wall and really show people, oh, you know, clothing is being made by people. I have a clothing line called Community Service that's all redesigned vintage pieces. So we take uh, vintage clothing and modernize it and update it. Wearing vintage clothing and redesigned vintage clothing definitely makes me feel like I'm contributing you know, to protecting the environment, which has always been very important to me in, in, in the ways of um, avoiding pollution, but also helping with textile waste. So for example, um, the silk shirt, we cropped in the back and we cropped the sleeves and then we cropped the front so you can tie it. And that's one of our best sellers. And so it's a design that we repeat. So here's another one. So these are uh, one of a kind vintage shirts, but when we redesign them in the same way, um, then they become more of a product. And also we're able to offer a variety of sizes available as well. So where do these fabrics come from? Um, these were vintage silk shirts that I bought either at a thrift store or at a vintage wholesale um, company. And, uh, and then I usually collect them for a while until we have enough that they look cohesive together in color and design, and then uh, we redesign them here. They look brand new. Mm -hmm. They look like they have never, ever been worn before. I, I see a change in that way too. When we first opened, um, you know, nine years ago, I think there was much more of a um, stigma still attached to wearing used clothing. This sweater is a, a vintage men's sweater and we cropped it here and we cropped the sleeves and then we actually took the bottom of the sweater and made it into a ruffle and then added it here as a ruffle on the sleeves. So this is your design? Yes. And that, yeah, so this is uh, also a repeatable design that we do with um, these vintage merino wool sweaters. I find them pretty regularly when I go thrifting. And so, yeah, so we can create these in different colors um, and different sizes. And look at it, it's just a beautiful piece. So what misconceptions have you heard about wearing vintage? A lot of misconceptions that I hear is that it's dated looking and it's, uh, you know, just, uh, it's almost costumey or it's not really appropriate for the modern fashion. But I think we have really uh, found a way of updating and modernizing vintage fashion that 
is, is influenced by current trends. Something when we walked in, I was really drawn to uh -huh. this sweater. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a vintage men's sweater um, that I found and then we cropped it uh, and we also cropped the sleeves so it's more flattering on a woman's body. Um, and yeah, so we have actually two that are similar that are both vintage men's sweaters. Here in Athens, we have the University of Georgia, and so I often talk to students here, and we have a lot of student interns, and I've definitely noticed a much bigger awareness about this issue. Um, so maybe five or six years ago, um, I constantly explain, like, what is sustainable fashion? What does that mean? And now the students come to me, and they know about sustainable fashion, they know about the issues, and they really want to do something about it. You know, just as a human being, I want to feel good when I wear clothes. I don't want to harm the planet when I get dressed in the morning. I don't want there to be someone suffering in a factory to make what I wear. I really believe that clothing should be something that makes us feel good because it's doing good in the world.